I'm Heather Herndon with Entertainment Partners, and I'm here today with Paul Steinke, Senior Vice President of Production Finance at Walt Disney Studios, and Mark Goldstein, President and CEO of Entertainment Partners. We're here today to talk about the entertainment industry's return to production. How are we dealing with the new guidelines for the COVID rules and regulations? And how are the new technologies helping to create safer sets? So welcome to both of you. Thank you, Heather. And Thanks, Paul, Heather. thank you for uh, joining us today. And we're socially distanced. That's been a crazy six, seven months. We had a couple months where no one really knew what was going on. And then we went into two or three months of deep planning and now we're back in production. So that feels really good. Yeah. There have been, yeah, certainly a lot of changes. How has Disney Studios managed through the COVID process? Well, uh, certainly the shutdown um, caught everybody uh, off guard and it was running all the scenarios that we had to run. But then as soon as the union negotiations started, our company created a COE, which is the center of excellence with our senior management. Uh, and they were the leaders in basically setting our guidelines. So between labor relations and then HR, they rolled it out with our production and legal teams. And, and how have the crews been responding to the changes? Has it been uh, extremely receptive? They want to be back to work also. And they also want to be safe in, in a safe environment. And I think we've really set that up with the union rules of creating the categories. You guys did so much planning, right? Um, how is it translating on the set? Now that you're back in production, like, is it going exactly like you guys planned? Or has there you know, been changes or any hiccups along the way? I'm sure we modify, you know, a little bit on the fly, but consistency is number one for our company. We want all of our productions to really manage the sets the same. So again, that's why the health and safety manager is that uh, that position has been created in that department. So that creates that consistency and any questions asked, you know, but by putting a signage up, that's actually, we've seen that that's really helped with people. And then of course, there's the daily testing that everyone does and people are really honoring, again, the, the zones A, B, C, and D. So people are either on set in their bubbles, off set in the offices, they might be working not in either place and they could be working at home. So Paul, how is um, the testing gone and how is the, um, the testing centers? We're hearing a lot from productions that there's a struggle of getting the test results back timely, that there's a lot of false positives. Like you talk about continuity and consistency, like how's that going for you guys in your productions? Testing has probably been the most difficult to implement because we can implement it, but it's finding the, the labs that have the testing capacity that can turn it around in a, in a timely manner. There's also the cost impact of it. And then of course, if we were to shut down and have a false positive, that could take a couple, you know, two, three, four days of being shut down. And then we've got to report those numbers up. Recently, we started seeing um, productions having some COVID issues and having some minor shutdowns or two week shutdowns. How's it going um, at Disney in terms of any production shutdowns? You know, luckily we've had limited impact to date and uh, we're using contract tracing to identify who they've been around so we can immediately uh, make the set safe. And then with the zones, keeping the ABCD zones going with health and safety managers, that again, keeps the set safe. Uh, are you seeing more <laughs> um, productions being shot in the lots in the studio rather than on location? So certainly uh, we are uh, requiring more stage space. We want a controlled environment as much as possible. We're finding because of social distancing, we need about 25, 30% more in stage space per project. And with that, we're also getting leases now to sort of protect our, because uh, there's so much co competition for stages right. to sort of pr protect our investment that we can get there. So Paul, we're seeing, um a lot of clients um, making the move to complete digital um, productions. So where does that rank in the priority for you guys in terms of coming back from COVID and going forward? Well, it was a major priority and now it's like the highest priority. Ultimately, it's all gonna create uh, efficiencies for the future. Is that what you're hearing from the other studios? Yeah, we've been hearing that from the studios as well about moving fast around digital production. The, the industry has always taken a cautious approach to adopting new technologies. Right. We'll develop flagship products, but then every studio and even divisions in studio will want to make sure that those digital technologies work for their specific needs. But recently, there's been a great need to go digital to come safe. And so we're seeing the industry across the board accept our flagship products so they can take advantage of what's there right now. We just recently released um, our smart um, PO purchase order product, 
And what would normally take nine or 10 months to get people on it, within the first 30 days, we had 50 productions on it. The second 30 days, we had over 100 new productions go on it. We're at 150 and we've had over $100 million of purchase order spend go through it. That would have taken nine to 12 months to get that level of volume and we got there in three months. Are you seeing any challenges? It sounds like adoption has been pretty, uh, uh, pretty solid. Uh, just like what Mark said is, you know, before we were very cautious and we might do a whole production cycle before we'd roll out a new tool. Now we're rushing. We want the tools. We were willing to take the risk if it's not quite ready uh, and partnering with a software company, EP. Um, so we're happy to have anything new. Like, that's exciting about the purchase order system. Are, are you selecting the, the digital platforms across the board or are you letting your individual accountants make the decisions or? Well, every workflow is different. Every show is different for different reasons, uh, but we definitely want to standardize where we can, but we're also willing to test. So uh, if a, an accountant is willing to look at another way to go paperless, we're like, okay, let's check that out because we haven't hundred percent formalized it and we are looking at tools. Do you have some key learnings or takeaways that you've, uh, that you've gathered through this process? Uh, well, certainly, but uh, the key takeaways would be uh, um, the fact that we can go paperless mm -hmm. and that we're working with tools that are getting us there. And it's still a lot of training for all of us. And the tools, some of the tools aren't ready, but we're you know, beta testing and getting them there. So when you think of now that you can have a digital production office, how practical is it for U.S. productions to work abroad in the coming months? We continue to work abroad. Like we're, uh, we're not changing any of our production uh, locations. These tools are just helping us in every country. So I want to shift gears a little bit and um, and talk about the the fact that now feature films are going to streaming channels like Disney Plus. So how are audiences reacting? Uh, they reacted positively because of that. We also reacted this summer. Like we reorganized our company into a, really streaming being our strategic future. But at the same time, I think uh, the audience also wants theatrical movies, and it's just going to be complementing uh, the streaming business. Do you think that movie theaters are going to be making a comeback? Uh, I certainly hope so. I go to movie theaters wherever they're open. I drive down to Orange County because the theaters are open there. I'm gonna go to a movie tonight. <laughs> but I, it definitely has changed and that's why the streaming platform is so lucky that we actually created that um, Disney Plus. <laughs> and that we're now making content that basically can sit on either theatrical uh, or uh, streaming, because we changed our distribution strategy where streaming is basically the end of our distribution platform. And you guys have had amazing results. I think in yesterday's paper, 73 million subscribers. And so it seems like you're now moving more towards a hybrid model, right? You're having the opportunity to continue to support the movie theaters with 10 pole productions, but yet as the world's moving more towards um, home entertainment, um, you're also starting to be able to do a lot more movies for the home entertainment experience. Um, do you see that permanently going forward? You know, we're making movies that, for all size, from low budget to high budget. But what's paramount for us is quality. Like we need to have the Disney quality if it's streaming or not. And also we're going to still be making tentpole movies and franchise films. But you might see them in theatrical and you might see them on, on the streaming platform. Yeah. And so how are the customers responding as moving to the to the home entertainment and the digital channels, is that impacting the profitability of the feature division? Well, I think uh, it's allowing our revenues to be enhanced by having both. And we can also make that decision, where is it best to put that title? Streaming, you know, where, where does the audience want to see it first? So is it changing the way you make decisions around how you're making feature films? Or is it more the decisions about, we have a great concept and this concept should go the theater route and this concept should go the home entertainment route? Now we have movies that we definitely know are going to be for streaming and we have movies that we think are going to be for theatrical. We also don't know, like the theatrical could possibly end up on streaming. It really just, again, it's strategic. It depends on where they feel the distribution is best served. And is that impacting the profitability of the films or are you able to? Well, thank God we had our streaming uh, D plus because we were able to move uh, tentpole movies like Mulan that was theatrical on, into the streaming platform. With, the box office being what it is today, we're relying more on streaming, but at some point box office is gonna come back up. So what changes are you seeing in the industry as far as production mixes? 
Yeah, well, it's been really fascinating to watch the feature divisions because five years ago, there was a lot of content, but a lot of range of production budgets. You had the tent poles, you had the smaller productions, but you also had this middle range of 50 to 100 million films being produced. And then the studio started moving towards more episodic. And so the film divisions started um, doing the high end films and the low end films because the middle range was basically the size of episodic production. But now with all the new channels and Disney Plus, we're actually seeing the feature films bring back those mid-range um, film productions because it's about the cost of, you know, an episodic um, series. Uh, we're seeing uh, um, so much content being made from um, episodic, like Star Wars is got their Mandalorian, um, and Marvel's making episodic. But we're also doing lower budgets uh, for theatrical. We've got uh, Fox Searchlight, and then also the franchise and the event titles. But streaming wants all of that. They want to see documentaries. That's what the audience is asking for. You know, it's allowing us to do a diversity launch pad of shorts where we're getting new filmmakers out um, and getting them uh, a platform to be seen. So Paul, we've been um, seeing a lot of industries like technology make permanent changes in terms of how they work. Um, what permanent changes are you, do you foresee um, with Disney and the industry in general in terms of how we work? Well, certainly I think certain departments uh, are going to be able to comfortably work from home. We're doing remote prepping on our shows right now, and that's successful. And then there's like virtual uh, reviews that we do for post-production uh, and our creative execs. And we want to limit our crowd scenes around actors to keep them safe. So with that, you're using visual effects to sometimes enhance the actors. And we also use VFX to basically replace location shooting. Yeah, and that's fascinating because when we were um, doing our planning, and we expected a lot less background actors on the set and a lot more visual effects. Yeah. But surprisingly, over the last month, um, central casting is um, incredibly busy with background actors. And so they're, they're not the massive scenes, but we're still seeing a lot of demand for background actors. And that was a little different for us because we thought, um, you know, it would take six, nine months next summer before we, before we, before we saw that production come back. Yeah, right, and because I, I don't think the scripts really have changed that quickly, right? We're still mm -hmm. making the same scripts that we were making just a year ago or eight months ago. So you probably do still require, of course, like extras. I think you always need that, but you can also shoot them in a different way yeah. and also put them in the, in the background and not have your cast in front. Yeah. Are, are you learning new things from your experiences with COVID overseas? I know that you do a lot of overseas productions and I, and I think there's probably a lot of lessons learned. I mean, we were fortunate to get uh, two movies up and running and one in Australia and one in New Zealand because they basically didn't have any COVID or a very small amount of COVID. So that, again, we were able to get best practices from that and then roll that out to our other shows. Mm -hmm. and, and what are we seeing as far as incentives and, and uh, the countries that are best for productions now? So we've actually seen a lot of, um, a lot of productions trying to go to less dense areas. So um, like New Zealand, Croatia, areas that are not as, not as populated. But we're also seeing that in the United States as well. We're seeing, um, Utah and Montana and Oklahoma, places where it's just, you know, more space, more outdoors. We're still seeing the Georgia and Louisiana and California pick up. New York, I think, is going to start up here, is starting to start up. But a lot of, a lot of planning around, is there a, a, more, a less dense population that we can, um, that people can shoot at? There's also so much content. So it's just, no matter where you're going, you're just, you know, you're trying to get in stages. Well, we know it's not a secret that with COVID, budgets um, have grown a lot from PPE equipment to testing. And in our master webinar series, we heard from some experts in the industry that they see production budgets going up 10, 15, 20, 25 percent. How is that um, going at Disney? Uh, certainly in the beginning of shutdown, it was a lot. It could be in the 25, 30 percent range. But basically now uh, with startups, it's, we're looking at 5 to 10 percent. And it really depends on the size of the budget because of the fixed costs. So with a smaller budget, it might be on the higher end of the five to 10%. And the larger budgets would be on the lower end because there's, you know, the cost of the crew size for the PPE, the insurance was a saving grace when we had COVID insurance. Now that we don't have it, there's a premium rise in insurance cost. And so we've got to factor that in. And how long did it take for you guys when you were thinking about redoing your budgets? Like what was the process to understand all these different costs that were coming in and, 
Um, did it take you a while to, to kind of figure out the template that you wanted to use? It was about a month of going back and forth to identify besides the shutdown costs and the revamp and the revamp being uh, the, the prep that was going to be required. And then we started figuring out, okay, what is the PPE? What are the health and safety uh, managers going to cost? And then really what was the impact to the new, to the schedules going to be? Cause you're going to have a larger, uh, you might have more shooting days, you might have travel, you're going to have uh, maybe higher crew rates at the time. So we have three buckets in our area. We've got our shutdown and revamp, we've got a direct COVID and wellness bucket, and then we've got our production and schedule impact bucket that we track. Yeah, so a lot more complicated trying to figure it out. So if you think of pre-COVID and you had a feature film, like how many budgets versions would you do? And now that you're post-COVID, how many budget versions are, have you have you guys done per production? On average, before COVID, we were probably doing every other month. And it's not dramatically different. There was a lot of budgeting during the summer to get our shows revamped. But once we got into the cycle and understood exactly what the protocols were, we're probably doing four to eight budgets on, on a typical movie. And what kind of contingencies or considerations are you building into your budgets that are different? Well, we're not really building in contingencies. We're trying to build basically budget as ac accurate as possible, mm -hmm. but there will be allowances for possibly somebody gets sick and then we've got to, to have money set aside for that. But we're not seeing extra days uh, for our shooting schedules. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing some unique financing issues? Uh, first, we had a limit cash, you know, the contact to contact person. So that was moving to like digital payments. And then we pivoted right away to wire transferring, you know, ACH. Uh, and with that, we then had our fraud and we had to work with Treasury on um, how do we get policies and procedures out on phishing emails. Insurance premiums went up. And so, you know, we had to make sure that we were putting those costs into the budget. And then what's really interesting and important is incentives aren't, uh, when you move from theatrical to streaming, they don't always transfer. So there's certain jurisdictions like the UK that if you go from theatrical to streaming midstream, then the spend no longer gets incentive on that point forward. So we're looking at in, uh, all the jur incentive jurisdictions around the world to see where, where we might have risk. Wow. So I have a question for both of you. Um, I don't know if, they, if it's fair to say there could be a silver lining to COVID, but is there anything that you're seeing that's been a positive that's come out of the last few months? Why don't we start with you? There have been definitely a few silver linings. We've been able to develop like better health and safety protocols that are really here to stay. And then of course the efficiencies of going digital and then the, the success we've had from work from home you know, with the Black Lives Matters movement, it coincided with uh, COVID and it actually allowed for a meaningful uh, conversation to push that in the forefront and put diversity in front of the camera, behind the camera and for the industry. Yeah, I would agree with a lot of statements um, Paul made. It's um, just been amazing how the industry's come together, you know, first on the safety protocols, but two around diversity, equality and inclusion. I mean, everyone's working together to make this a better, better place. Um, it's been fantastic to see the advancement around digital technology. You know, it makes music to our ears. You know, there's uh, clearly a great demand for content. Um, people are ready for the new content to come out. But what's also been interesting is um, it's been great to see a lot of the libraries and the, some of the old time classics and mm -hmm. films and television come back to life and go back to people that are, have seen them and go to first time you know, viewers of, of some of the classics that, that we've had um, in the industry. And, and so you, you, you've, sort of, you've sort of given your, your thoughts, but if you had a crystal ball, what do you see for the, the future of the industry? Yeah, I just continued uh, incredible demand for content. You know, we, we've seen it for the last three or four years, but when, when you have it and the new content gets taken away, it just shows that there's just such a demand yeah. to continue to see that. So I think we're great. And I think we're going to see um, work-life balance, you know, be be different going forward, too. I think um, we've all had a chance to reassess our lives and companies have had a chance to reassess how we put people in a great position to deliver great content. And I think it's um, it could be really positive for the future. So, Paul, when you look in your crystal ball, what do you see for the future of the industry? Well, it's a very exciting time. You know, Hollywood has evolved now into a streaming industry complemented by theatrical box office. Content's always going to be king. I, I agree with Mark on that. And uh, I really think like the future is now. We're working in it. Which is a great place to end. And thank you so much for sharing your insights and participating with us. 
Great. Yeah, Thanks. thank you, Paul. We really appreciate you being here. And, you know, we're trying to reach out to the entire community so everyone can keep learning, you know, from each other. So thank you for bringing your insights and experience. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me.